So we're going to move on to the next section now, and that's what Australia Ask is all about, is really understanding, or trying to give a voice to regional Australia, all right? and um, Gosford and the Central Coast being a part of that. Um, one of the things which um, is a big issue uh, is mental health. All right? um, now, you're the Parliamentary Secretary for Disability, so let's focus on mental health within um, that community. What are some of the things which we, we should know, firstly, and then what are some of the things we're trying to do to help? Well, I re actually really think the NDIS is a hugely important development in the mental health of people with disabilities. I mean, inclusion and being out as part of society is what you expect in your life. And it's not really something that has been part of an expectation of people with disabilities. We've lived in the medical framework and now we're living in a social framework, which I think had a huge shift. The Royal Commission's been a really important part, I think, of the mental health around living with abuse and neglect. And having that voice on the table is almost a space of truth, truth telling and healing. And so the outcomes and the recommendations, what, 220 recommendations, it's a big journey to put all of them in place. But I think just even having the stories told has been incredibly important for people living with disability and the frustrations within the system and the frameworks of operation. But also the transparency of having that there is super important moving forward. I also think from a non-disability inclusion mental health perspective on the coast here, we've got Rose Jackson, the Minister of Mental Health, actually coming up to the Central Coast next week, which is super cool to have a look at some of the projects that we've got going around the place. We've got this organisation that's run by Gosford North Rotary called SOC, Save Our Kids From Suicide, that are going around and providing education to sporting leaders and teams to just raise awareness about suicide prevention, so much so that one of the male rugby coaches who did the program, he actually believes he saved his daughter's life because of the education program in place there. So slowly chipping away, as well as that, we're actually delivering something called The Haven. So the previous government really hasn't done a great job providing housing for people living with mental health challenges. But in Victoria, I think the Andrews government's now up to 16 of these Haven facilities. So we're actually delivering one of those for the Central Coast. And this has been a beautiful journey. When I first got elected, I had a lovely older couple come into the office and say, Lisa, we need someone for people with mental health to live in opposition. This is a frustration. You don't have the money. And I've written to the government, they really don't care. So finally, sort of six years later, we're in government. We're actually, Joy, Jocelyn and Neil are so excited that we'll actually be delivering this on the Central Coast. So we're looking at locations, working with the health system about where we can actually build something, which is a great, it might be a forever home, but hopefully for a lot of people living with mental illness to get things balanced again. It's a transitional space while they're, while they're recovering to get back out into the community and it's just something we don't have. So if, if you're um, suffering from mental health, um, where is somewhere you would recommend they go? And, and we'll put the link on the Oh, absolutely. The so we've there. got, a RAFME has been part of our community for ages, which is basically a wraparound support for carers people living with mental health but we've also just newly opened Safe Haven. So Safe Haven's right there at Gosford Hospital, you can see it as you drive up and it's it's just a, a safe place to go where you've got professionals there, you've got people with lived experience, you may just need some quiet time because a lot of the challenge is we just don't have enough mental health professionals, we don't have enough psychiatrists and to get into psychologists etc etc. So that's sort of a, a crisis it's not the ideal, I mean, ED is the first and foremost, but that's a, that's a new opening that the federal government supplied. Now we've got a Labor federal government to support people and it's right there at Gosford Hospital. Hmm. Um, so as the member of Gosford, I'm guessing you've got some pet projects. But I believe there's one over there. <laughs> there's one. Over, there's two from where we can sit right now. It's wonderful. Can you maybe talk us through a couple of them? Uh, I'm, I'm jumping out of my seat, jumping out of my lovely grandfather's lounge. Um, right there at Gosford Waterfront. I mean, this is something that everybody's been talking about for 40 years, and I really don't like talking about it till we actually see some shovels in the ground. But we've committed eight and a half million dollars to really do a good look into what's possible there and start start the ball rolling. So it's going to happen while I'm in the job. Like I, it's, it'll be a 20 year and a phased project, I imagine. Yep. And it's a hugely expensive. The plans that Gosford Council initially drew up, they asked for $681 million. I mean, Ooh. Put, take that out of the taxpayers' money, that's the whole state budget, but no. So it will take some time and it'll probably be a private-public partnership because the private investment have got money to do it and there'll be resident. I suspect there'll be residential on the beautiful waterfront. I mean, it's not glamorous 
under the water land down there and so the council Rickhart's drawing pictures of marinas it's going to be a very costly adventure to take that toxic dirt away to put a full scaled yacht marina, marina in yeah. place the locals know that but the pictures and it's interesting the poor old central coast community have been fed so many pictures of dreams that haven't been delivered so i'm really reluctant to launch any more pictures of something until it's actually tangible and real and coming yeah the other thing is, it's in my head, and I'm sorry it's not there yet, and this is six years in opposition, but over there we've got Marine Rescue and Brian McGowan's Bridge. So at the moment, I mean, the Gosford waterfront is beautiful, but it just goes to the bridge, and the bridge ain't a very glamorous place down there. So having a bike path, a, a walkway path link from Marine Rescue down to the bridge, just so the Gosford waterfront's active, and also for me, active transport's a huge part of our environmental future. Yeah. I live on the peninsula because it's flat and fantastic for people with disabilities, but we've got lots of cyclists that can then cycle into Gosford for work or for leisure. So it would just be a game changer to link the cycle. I mean, it goes all the way around the back now, but if we make that part of our apartment living, Gosford's definitely going to go up. Part of our apartment living, linking and getting people connected to the waterfront is something that we don't have yet. And I'm assuming we can use the old piers from the old bridge and maybe put something across there and things so there's a few options I'm sure. Yeah I know and I'm not an engineer people tell me how we should be dredging the channel on a very regular basis I'll leave that in the hands of the qualified people but based on community consultation and input of course. Excellent. Excellent. These are both going to be beautiful projects but are there any other projects just the nuts and bolt projects which everyday projects which help people that you really think we should be knowing about what's going on? Well the Gosford University dig is happening in December, so it's going to be fantastic. The, the University of Newcastle Gosford Town Centre building is going to be an absolute game changer for our community. I am so excited as a, as a UON graduate. Yeah. It really is going to be, it's, it's going to go up really quickly. The contract, I think, has been delivered, like signed today yeah. for the build. But it's a, it's a wood construction, so it's going to go up really quickly. Maybe, which is, maybe you might want to talk a few people through exactly where it is and mm, the location. Opposite the train station, opposite the bus station, just up the road a little bit, the old Mitre 10 building. It's blue, it's not so glamorous. Yeah. Um, it's got a block of land beside it, so it won't just be the university component. There'll be something that goes in behind it related to the university in the future as well. The government's got to find money for all these things. But it's going to be a beautiful... A beautiful addition and also an invigoration having those young people in the town centre having the academics in the town centre is lovely it will ch create a challenge though dragging some of the courses from the Arimba campus so we're also looking at the future of the Arimba campus and where we go from there. I, I know adding the nurses and doctors um, campus has made a big change in Gosford oh. seeing all the nurses and the doctors walk through Gosford on a regular basis so having the extra people will be Great. Huge. And also my other goal is to actually link the Central Coast community into our fantastic Central Coast Research Institute. The tower of built the tower that you're speaking about between the car park and the hospital on there on the right, it just looks like a cafe to the people wandering past. But what's going on there is something that we should be so proud of, but I think something that Coasties don't necessarily know about at the moment. So I've got a youth leadership forum happening there just next week. So really trying to get Coasties connected, but also promoting the opportunity to study here on the Central Coast, all those health sciences. So you said before your, your sister's a nurse. Um, trained at Gosford Hospital. There you How's go. that? That's where I was going to lead into. <laughs> ha having nurses trained at Gosford Hospital is, is such a benefit because then we get to keep our local people. We don't have to move people in. Local people can become nurses. And Absolutely. Yeah. And Newcastle Uni has got a really high success rate of pe first in family as well and local people that are staying. So really promoting that across the coast. Also the cost of living. If For kids to go and live out of out of home now is just exorbitant for uni students. So I think a really important consideration to be able to look at good quality education close to home on the coast makes me super proud. So on nurses, um, before the, uh, the election, there was a lot of talk about um, fixed ratios and things, trying to just help our nurses because they, they'd gone through so much pain during COVID, just trying to help them. Uh, and it was something they all wanted. Um, so how's that going in government? The safe st staffing, Ryan Park, our Minister for Health, is just this amazing guy. He's so, like, he's so determined. But yeah, they've signed a signed a 
memorandum of understanding whatever the steps are towards safe staffing so we would love to do ratios in the whole hospital from the very beginning but we just don't have enough nurses I mean the challenge and the the heartbreak for our nurses at Gosford Hospital is they just don't have enough nurses to replace nurses when they're sick even now so encouraging people in so we will start with one to three in ED, which is sort of that crisis point to make sure that nurses aren't overstretched in their workplace. And that then that expansion will roll out across the hospital as we get more nurses to be able to deliver. Because the problem is if we sign it up and there aren't enough nurses, wards have to be shut down. So we've got to do it in a slow rollout whilst we and re and connect and make sure we've got the nurses to be able to deliver. It almost feels like things may have just fallen apart for a while and now we're trying to build a strategic plan it really on how feels, to... I mean, in education as well, it really, it's like, and even in the fire brigade, like there've been, I think, $90 million in overtime, which actually should have been more fireys on the job. So Chris Min's committed to 600 new fireys at the election. We've got new AMBOs because there just weren't enough paramedics being recruited into the whole system. And the teacher shortage is just out of control. So there's just hundreds of hours every week of kids left Un, like supervised in the playground and ne lessons not being delivered because the previous government just neglected the fact of the staff shortages that were going on across our public sector. So it really feels like Labor has to come in and fix all these problems, all this neglect that the previous government left behind. I mean, teachers' wages are now, they've gone from the bottom in Australia to the best paid in Australia, which we've got to attract young people into this crucial profession because realistically, if we don't educate our young people, what have we got moving forward as a state? So how do we focus on, on these three areas that you've just said, the, the um, emergency services, the, the nurses and, and the teachers? How do we focus on the regional areas and not just bring people in into Sydney uh, more and more, you know? Um, being able to get doctors to move out or, or develop our local people. How, how do we do that? Even, I mean, Gordon Reid in our community, the previous government sort of had a contract sign where the doctor, there was no incentives to come to this region. So Gordon Reid and Emma McBride have worked really hard to change that contract around. We're actually starting to get some new doctors coming into the Central Coast. So that's, I mean, and we, we call ourselves a region, but relative to regional and remote, we are really well off, as frustrating as that is. But yeah, it's a real challenge. We had an inquiry into regional health in the, in the parliament whilst we were in opposition and it really highlighted the, the massive gaps out there. So even opening up and resourcing um, maternity facilities so people don't have to leave their whole community to give, give birth, but also the, tele, the telehealth conversation and the, and the tele-delivery is a hugely important way of being. It's not something we're necessarily comfortable with, but if you don't have a doctor in your local town, you really can get an expert online. And so Ryan Park and the health system is really working to try and improve those communications to get expert delivery and also your test results analysed by experts so in the regional communities you can get outcomes and then if you need to be shipped out you need to be shipped out but your local doctors can provide that support with expert supervision so it's, it's a long way going and the cost of getting nurses I mean we need more nurses here so we don't want to give up our nurses to move to the bush so the really the cost and delivery of promoting those careers to regional communities is super important but also I think sitting in the back when COVID hit, I did a great big push on the importance of work from home. Yeah. And work from home really has changed people's lives. And it's definitely changed our community. It's put a whole bunch more money back into the Central Coast. We were spending about $400,000 a day in Sydney, like every every 40,000 commuters, 10 bucks, there you go. Yeah. Um, but that's being spent in our community now. But the, the beautiful thing is we've, we've got people in the public system living and working in their regional communities. So if there's another couple of families living in the communities, that means the schools have got a, a, a few more kids in them. It means that there's a bit more NDIS, a bit more aged care going on. So it actually supports our regional communities to grow in a way that didn't happen before COVID and some decent wages so people don't have to leave their regional community to get decent wages, I think is also important. So uh, bringing new families into uh, regional locations uh, made me think of uh, refugees and, and it, um, people which are moving here for um, key jobs, you know, which we need. Um, the, I hear quite often that country towns can be transformed by bringing in a, a new family which has four or five kids, the nurse, um, is moving in or the school teacher brings these four or five kids and things. How do we continue to 
understand that Australia is built on immigration. Um, yeah. We all of us need it, but regional Australia particularly. Absolutely, and those I mean those key jobs I mean that keeps communities alive. I mean the abattoir and the meatworks that is fueled and sourced by refugee employees and. and um, immigrants, it's super important to hold regional communities alive. And so, and I think looking at how we resource business growth and development, so there are the employment opportunities in regional communities, super important, but I mean, and it's tough, people don't want the migrants coming in and the housing prices, etc. but everybody needs employees. And you talk to any business across the central coast, they're crying out for employees. So the reality is we need employees, whether it be here on the coast or beyond, or, or the Sydney businesses as well. Outside of your, your parliamentary duties, um, sport is a big part of your life. Right. <laughs> As it is with most Australians, yeah. But there's been a clear shift in sport since COVID. A lot of people aren't as engaged in their community in sporting things. Um, how do we build things back up in, in, mm. in that sporting? So we're, as Australians were, were known that we all participated in a sport. That was, you know, mm. the second question you would always ask is, what's your sport, yeah. you know? <laughs> so how do we try and build that up again that our definition of what we are as strange, yeah, we're sportsmen. That's, that's, that's a, really good que a really good question. I think that formation comes in schools and making sure that we've got our teachers resources well enough to be able to deliver that. And I think a huge impact of the teacher shortage is that, and the bureaucratic pressure put on our teachers is that teachers don't have time to do the coaching and all those additional things that they'd led into that kid's sporting growth that they take into life and so freeing teachers I actually believe as a former teacher but freeing teachers up to be able to do those coaching things is super important because if you haven't got a strong basis as a young kid you don't take that journey forward and that's and then the busyness of parents as well I think is something that's having an influence but then also I know that parents are spending every weekend as taxi drivers supporting their kids across the communities. Yeah. Mm. Uh, I found that um, during COVID in my, in my household having that bit of downtime um, w was good. <laughs> we loved it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but getting back and my, my family getting back into sport was also really good. You know, mm. my, my three children are very into their sports and I, I'm happy to help, but um, it, it's something which I can see in our community. Sports just come off the boil a bit and I don't know mm. if it's something we need to actively promote again. That's, that's, a, that's a good thought and leave, leave that one with me. But I also think there's a huge bunch of gratitude to our sports coaches and our sports managers and all, the pressure on those people who have their refereeing decisions questioned and their administrative questions, their questions like, hey, let's just celebrate and let these volunteers do the best they possibly can and support them to help our kids to say sport rather than run them into the ground because it really, I, I want to make, make it as easy as possible for our kids to play sport and let's support our coaches and our managers and admin that are doing great jobs. And that's part of that is what else do you need grant wise? And the sports grants are open at the moment. The community building partnerships have just closed as well. So there are also to all our sporty people out there, programs to support your sporty club as well, if you've got visions and enough time to do the bureaucratic apologies work <laughs> to get, get down that journey. So we might put that, um, the grants uh, thing on the bottom of the screen. So please go, and, well go and have a look. Grants. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yep, great. So we were talking about COVID just then. What happened for you during COVID? What was your life like? It was, I mean, we've got a tight knit group in the office. All of a sudden we were in our own home. So we had this midday check-in, which was about staying sane because it was so intense interpreting the rules and trying to explain what the rules were and helping everybody with their, the challenges around the rules. But I also found when I left teaching, I'd actually gone to four days a week to set up my dream, which was in my head, which was a Paralympian mentoring program, the national program. So all of a sudden, after about eight o'clock at night, you couldn't ring people up anymore. And so I set, I wrote the curriculum for the National Paralympian Mentoring Program. My girlfriend and I ran a pilot of the National Paralympian Mentoring Program, which before COVID was going to be a fly in the people with the wheelchairs and the guide dogs and the food allergies and the transport. All of a sudden it became online. So what we were able to shift and change. And so the Paralympic Mentoring Program, we then got a grant. I mean, I'm not doing it anymore, but we got a grant and it's in its third iteration with Paralympians with experience mentoring young people with disabilities into their sporting lives and into their lives. So it was a little bonus. Little There was lots of COVID bonuses that occurred across our community as well. So I, I was traveling all around the world before COVID and then coming back and being able to do all my meetings online, it, it's changed my life, you know, and 
Well, yes, it was hard for a lot of people, and uh, you know, being isolated was painful for a lot of people, and a lot of people um, lost opportunities in their life. I personally found it quite a, quite rewarding, and I got closer to my family for it. Absolutely. And the other joyful thing, there's been lots of people who have changed their business life and have set up micro business and changed their business. So if you are one of those people, the New South Wales Business Concierge have got ways to assist you on the next steps of expansion because there's businesses running out of our community that w were only dreams before. So I, I've heard talk that there's something big coming on <laughs> in a little bit, something worldwide, world champions or something. So what's going on? Just there, we've got the World Championship water skis next week. Like next week? Yeah, yeah, so the, it's the 11th to the 19th, yeah. right here. Last time it was in France, in Vichy in France, but we're hosting it here in Gosford. So it's part of the change. People need to get ready and get used to Gosford being the beautiful place it is. I mean, this it's pristine. We take it for granted, I think, because it's here all the time, but the world is coming to showcase right here. So I'm guessing we can just hop on the waterfront and You just and take watch. anywhere on the water. There will be exclusion zones. The maritime <laughs> group are going to be doing some exclusion zones around it. So I think it's a one point something K course down there, but we can sit along the waterfront and enjoy over the other side and enjoy it. It's four, four intense days of particularly racing, but I mean, people have seen some people training around the place. There's a, a champion, a world champion girl from the Hawkesbury who's been coming up and training, and they, they train on all the different waterways just to get ready because they don't know what weather what it's going to be. Gonna be yeah. It's going to be fantastic. It's really going to put us in the spotlight around the world. Well, it's going to showcase the beauty of, of our Brisbane water. You know, we're, we're so lucky to We are so here. lucky. I know, and every day, every day I wake up, as I said, every morning that sunrise over the water, we need to make sure we continue to breathe in the beauty of where we live. I agree, I agree absolutely.